Good afternoon. My name is Jay Violet Gannon, and I am the executive director at the Manchester Community Library and a longtime lover of miniatures. I don't know if many of you have been to the miniature room at the Art Institute of Chicago, but it is where I lived for 10 years, and it is where I fell in love with miniatures. It's also my understanding that one of my dear, dear, dear um, artist admirers aficionados of all things miniature by the name of Wes Anderson spent copious amounts of time while coming up with his ideas for the Grand Budapest Hotel. So I'm really excited that we're here today at this beautiful bookstore in Manchester to welcome someone who's really spent a lot of time on this issue. And to introduce our guest today, I have David. Just call me very quickly. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Well, good afternoon, and thanks so much for coming to Northshire. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce Kate Usme Unver, Esme Unver, sorry, uh, presenting the book of Mini, Inside the Big World of Tiny Things. After her presentation, there'll be time for a few questions before we move downstairs, where copies of her book are available for purchase and signing. And please take this moment to silence your cell phones. Kate Esme Unver is a social media and communications professional from 2012. Kate launched the Daily Mini on Instagram, a digitally curated space that promotes miniatures and small-scale news through interviews and studio visits uh, with internationally renowned artists and designers. She currently serves on the board as the on the board of trustees of the International Guild of Miniature Artisans and provides social media consultancy services to miniature makers around the world. She's been collecting miniatures for over two decades. Reviewers have called the Book of Mini a fabulous documentation and celebration of all the different ways people all over the world create small things and a must for any miniaturist. Please join me in welcoming to Northshire, Kate S. Bateman. boyfriend Ryan, to my publisher, and to anyone and everyone that loves a mini, has a mini, is interested in minis, doesn't doesn't know about minis but wants to, um, thank you. Thank you for being here. Okay, so before we begin, what is a miniature? If you know it, if you think you know it, shout it out. What, what do we mean when we say miniature? Small. 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 Tiny. Tiny? Tiny. Little? I'll take little. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> no, no wrong answers there. So really when we talk about miniatures, we mean a smaller representation of something in large scale, so something full size. So for the sake of this discussion, uh, we'll be talking quite a bit about 1 12th scale miniatures, which can be seen right here. So it means that one inch is equal to one foot. So. If you're talking about a moose, which I hear can be anywhere from five, six, seven feet tall at the shoulder, a miniature moose would come in at about five, six, seven inches in height. <clears throat> now, the word miniature is very interesting in and of itself. You can pronounce it two ways. You can pronounce it with the A, miniature. I've heard people say miniature. Both ways are correct. The etymology of the word is very interesting because it does not come from what you think it might come from. It doesn't come from minor or minuscule or anything like that. It actually dates back to Latin and it means red lead. So talking about um, vermilion or red paint. And from there, the etymology changed from uh, red lead to, to color red, so to underline or um, draw attention to a word. and then to illuminate, and then from there you get illuminated manuscripts. So, 
get in the hang of this? Okay, so we'll, <laughs> we'll rewind a little bit and talk about miniatures and history just for a moment. So, <coughs> miniatures, the concept of miniatures is not new, but the purpose of them is evolving. So, uh, throughout history, the Egyptians um, would have miniatures buried with them in their tombs so that they could help them in the afterlife, so give them and provide them with everything that they need, the tools, <coughs> the animals, the furniture, um, servants, everything that they need in the afterlife. So here's an example here. And in the 17th and 16th um, centuries in Amsterdam and in England and all throughout Europe, there were also examples of um, baby houses where uh, women would essentially show... Does, is anyone here familiar with the uh, PBS series and there's a, a well-known book, The Miniaturist by Jesse Burton? Yes. yes. You know, it's like I'm talking about miniatures, but I feel like we have uh, those different graphs. So, so the term baby and baby house is coined from the old English word meaning doll. And doll houses of this period showed idealized interiors complete with detailed furnishings and accessories. So the cabinets were built by hand and they were filled with miniature household items and were solely intended for adults. So oftentimes it would be a way to show um, essentially, you know, uh, an idealized vision of your house or what, you know, things that you, things that you might not have in, in full scale, but you could depict uh, in miniature. Pause a minute. Does anyone know what this image is? There's no wrong answers here today. It is a miniature room. It is an entryway. Oh, okay, we're two for two. Anyone else? Yes? Is it one of the thorn rooms? It is one of the thorn rooms. So, what are the thorn rooms? I'm going to, I can tell you, but does anyone know where they are? I think we might have heard in the introduction. They're in Chicago. They're also all over the U.S. So, the thorn... The thorns, really nothing can do, can do them justice, I think, um, but, but seeing them, so, <clears throat> if I may, <laughs> the 68 thorn miniature rooms enable one to, to glimpse elements of European interiors from the late 13th century to the 1930s and American furnishings from the 17th century to the 1930s. They were painstakingly constructed on a, on one twelve scale, as we talked about, and they were conceived by Mrs. James Ward Thorne of Chicago uh, between the 1930s and the 1940s. They were created by a total of about 33 master craftsmen, and everything is, is true when it comes to the materials. So if something depicted um, is gold, it's gold here. If something has dovetailed, dovetailed joints, it's fully functional. If something has a, a lock, the lock will, you know, there's unbelievable details. And so the concept behind these, um, Mrs. Thorne, it, it's really twofold. She got the idea, people think, from the royal dollhouses that existed um, in Europe. In England, there's Queen Mary's dollhouse, which started um, and debuted right around 1920. So. <clears throat> she also had an interest in miniatures herself, Mrs. Thorne, but she really wanted to show these museum quality spaces on a small scale. So if you go to a museum today and there's an entire room, whether it's Egyptian art or, you know, Colonial Williamsburg, that's great, but how do you transport that across America, an entire room this big? You can't. So throughout a period of really less than 10 years, eight years, she created, had a hundred of these rooms crafted. So at any given time in Chicago, there are 68 on display, way back when, about 69. And today, um, there are, they believe, 99 still in existence. So there's some in Kansas. Um, there's actually one in Philadelphia this weekend. 
it's for sale. Um, but they are absolutely marvelous. Um, one thing of note in these images, so at the time, only in Europe did they really have this wallpaper that showed a landscape all the way across. So Mrs. Thorne debuted things to the United States um, that had never been seen before in miniature. And, um, you know, at that time, I think it really, it, it transcended miniatures for the sake of, um, of art, and it was much more about the history and the interior design, and it just provided people a lens into other worlds that they might not have otherwise been able to see. Um, so I would like to take a minute and read a, um, an excerpt from an essay um, by one of the sons of the, uh, one of the master craftsmen who helped put together these rooms. Um, the gentleman who worked on these in the 30s, Eugene Kupchak, had two sons who helped him um, as they got older in, in his workspace to create these rooms and preserve the legacy. His two sons, um, Henry and Jay, and Henry passed away earlier this year, and he was very helpful um, when it came to my putting together this book. He was always available a phone call away, um, and uh, he never got to, to see the book itself, but he played a very big part in it coming together. So I just want to read a little bit excerpt, uh, of an excerpt um, from something that he wrote, and then I'll also show one of the works that he created, a couple of views from it. So this is an Ottoman coffee house that's on view in Istanbul at the Koch Museum. Um, and I'll show a couple of views as I read some of his words. <clears throat> These little virtual realities are a synthesis of what we know in our imagination, what they should look like, a Hollywood dream vision, so to speak. They are, therefore, more than real because they tap into the gestalt of our collective memory, and as such, are more pure realization. This is miniaturization with the purpose of elevating the common experience and transforming it into the collective dream vision of a time or place beyond us. These miniature rooms act as magical objects to project our best intention of how we wish it were. They are a virtual world directly in one's face to wonder how it could possibly be fashioned while adoring the fact that we are being fooled. This is transformation by one's imagination to a more perfectly formed world. So the Kupchak le legacy lives on in the second son, Jay, who still um, you know, is a liaison to the Chicago Art Institute and helps, you know, if a thorn room is in not disrepair, but if it needs a little bit of repair, if, if wood seems to be warping. I've heard stories that one room, for whatever reason, you know, the floorboards, just every every summer something happens, so they have to go in, in and do a repair, or if um, silver needs polishing. So um, just another quick quote from uh, Mr. Kupchak, who passed away earlier this year. <clears throat> so it is human nature to hold what cannot be grasped to encircle the limitless and have dominance by being several orders of magnitude greater than what we contemplate. The world in a box, all for us, at our feet. So, speaking of the world in a box, does anybody here collect miniatures? Few hands. Does anyone have a, a miniature at home, whether it's a magnet, a keychain, a toy, something, I think, maybe all of us in some way or another, right? I think even in this room, there's miniatures, if, you know, if, I think that's a dollhouse, was that a dollhouse right there? Um, so that leads me to talk about, when we talk about the, uh, the world in a box, all for us at our feet. So miniatures mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. You know, psychologists have talked about uh, the whole concept of control, where if, they're, if someone experiences a loss of control in their life, a death of a loved one, a uh, tragic a accident, they might want to have this return to childhood where they are able to have control or dominance in a, in a dollhouse, where they can curate um, a space and, you know, 
put forth an idealized um, life or world for themselves. It could also just be uh, about a returning to a simpler time, about childhood. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about me and then we'll <clears throat> get back to Minnie's and uh, the book of Minnie. So I was born in Istanbul and I really think that miniatures have been in my DNA since I was zero, since I was one, since I was two. Um, my mom had this 80s chunky charm necklace that she placed on my stroller, so it was the first thing I saw when I looked out in the world. So really, yeah, that indoctrination of mini um, happened quite quickly. I grew up in northern New Jersey, and I remember when I was very young, I spent much of my allowance at this local dollhouse store, uh, which has since closed. That might sound familiar, too, you know, you, you might remember a craft store or a miniature store way back when that um, maybe you popped into or, or purchased a gift from. Um, I went to school in Indiana where I majored in art history. In 2012, December 2012, coming up on seven years now, I started posting an image of a miniature from my collection once a day on Instagram, which is, um, if you're not familiar, it's a social media platform similar to Facebook, but it really removes the need for lengthy captions or text, and it's um, very much picture-based. So fast forward to, this is a bit of a close-up from the other shot, to my collection growing over time, where I would say at any given time I had, I had hundreds of minis, really. Um, and so for, for maybe the first hundred days or so, I would post miniatures for my collection. And then it just grew, it grew exponentially, which I think any in any community you have that engagement and that interest um, from people. So folks would send me images of their miniatures, they would send me miniatures in the mail. Um, I have some of my favorites for my collection up here. I would encourage you after the talk to, to take a peek. Um, and yeah, and really it, it took off. So some of the favorite minis that I like to collect, you know, everyone has their own. I love miniature plants. They're all kind of gathered here in this image. Um, and they're not, you know, we talk about miniatures that have the true material. They're not made of plant matter. They're not organic. Mm -hmm. So some of them are made out of clay, out of paper, some out of wood. <clears throat> so, to talk a little bit about how we got from there, from collecting minis to here. Um, so, it, I, I really want to take this moment to thank the miniature community because they were exceptionally warm and welcoming. They were open to sharing not only their images, um, but stories about how they created this stuff. What drove them to create, what drives someone to create this, what compels them to create something as remarkable as this, and how do you get started in something like this, you know, what is your, uh, you know, how do you dip your toe into the miniature world, I've only known a world where I've loved minis, I don't know, any, I don't know anything else, but for, for so many people there's a gateway into minis, um, so these are some, some images from the book as well. <coughs> On the left we have um, work by Trudy Mago, who's an artist in Sri Lanka, who recently had to retire from, from making uh, miniatures, um, but these M&Ms, I still can't get over it. <laughs> I can't. Um, and then right here we've got uh, work by uh, Mikhail Giver, who's an artist in Israel, and every time she makes a miniature animal, she names them. And they really each have their own personalities, I think. She uses real animal fur, feathers to create these, um, and really gets the eyes right. You know, so oftentimes, um, I didn't mention this earlier, but in the thorn rooms, you never see the human figure. And oftentimes, it's, it's nearly impossible to get that right, to have life in, uh, life exude through, a, you know, a doll figure or figurine. But she really finds a way, I think, in these animals to bring them to life. Um, and then the last one is an artist out of Canada, and she not only makes miniatures, but miniature jewelry. So she might have a, you know, pineapple as one earring and a slice of pizza as the other. <laughs> <clears throat> so I started going down this rabbit hole 
2012, 13, 14, 15, where I was finding miniatures that were blowing my mind. Um, you know, if you think about, in any given thorn room, there could be 200 miniature objects, maybe 20. And so think about just looking at each one, removing each one, and really from all, all 360 degrees. So this is a, a work by William Robertson, William Robertson, who is a master of his craft, and he um, uses true materials in all his work. He's also known for um, incorporating uh, incorporating intricacies in things like this that you just would never see. So there might be a bottom layer of this drawer that you're not supposed to see, and actually might be filled with stuff, and it's for no one else to see but him, to know that it was there. Um, he creates a lot of works that have working locks and joints and all of that. Um, so this is another image. Does anyone see in this image the object for scale? The it's the dollar bill, yeah. Um, and in the previous one it was the paintbrushes. So it's, it's really, you know, there's two, almost two schools of thought. There are shooting miniatures and having them depicted without an object for scale so that it's a trick of the eye. Um, and then there are, because if this wasn't here, if this wasn't here, this really does look like it's, it's George Washington's um, desk, it's his office, yeah. as it, you know, as they might have, uh, it, it's the artist's <coughs> rendition of it. But yeah, without this dollar bill, this looks like an actual room, full scale, full size. Um, so. I really believe in the value of including an object for scale in the shot so that you, it just makes the, it makes the viewer completely confused, delighted, whatever it is. Um, and so down this rabbit hole I went and eventually I learned about the International Guild of Miniature Artisans who um, have been around since the late 70s and <clears throat> the guild was formed in order to promote fine miniatures as, as an art form and remove them from the category of crafts. So they do this by placing miniatures in museum collections and gallery exhibitions through involvement in local, state, national art foundations and also through conducting a public auction every year, which is very exciting seeing miniature works, um, yeah, bid on, uh, you know, about a minute or two, and the, the price really jumps, and it's incredible. So every year since 1982, the Guild hosts and um, has this school. So the International Guild of Miniature Artisans Guild School is held in Castine, Maine, where every year in June, 200 artists from all around the world come to learn from these master makers. So this gentleman, John Almeida, <clears throat> from Hawaii, has these portable miniature pottery wheels where everyone is creating pottery, hand turn on, wheel turn, um, wheel thrown pottery, and each pottery piece is on a poker chip so that it's easier to just get off. It's absolutely incredible. They glaze them after. Um, it's remarkable. It's one of the most fun classes, I think, because, I don't know, because you get a little bit dirty and you can create different shapes. You don't have to follow a mold, necessarily. Um, there's also an artist, Althea Chrome, who creates, she, She's amazing. She, she describes herself as a conceptual fiber artist. Um, and she, if you're familiar with the 2009 film Coraline, it's out of uh, Leica Studios. She, she dressed the main character, so created um, her sweater and, and some of her adornments as well. So she teaches how to make something like this in, in class. It's remarkable. Down to the buttons. And everything works. Um, so her needles, which she creates herself, oftentimes these artists will create their own tools. Her needles can accommodate more than 80 stitches per inch. Um, 
And she, so she'll design her own original knitting patterns, uh, oftentimes using a, co a computer platform and all that. Okay, so in 2015, um, I was invited to attend uh, Guild School. And I will say that was a pivotal moment in my life. It really changed the course of my life. Um, you know, walking into a walking into a space where I was surrounded by other people that loved miniatures, making miniatures. The energy was incredible, um, and yeah, it really goes down as one of those pinnacle moments that you you have the fourth. You know, you look back and you're like, wow, okay, that's where my life took a turn in a good way. <laughs> took a turn. Um, so later that year, I joined the board of IGMA where I've been helping them with um, really anything, you know, social media, communications, marketing related. And um, from, from there, I think I really attribute that to the growth of Daily Mini, the Instagram account, the website, um, where I would interview artists. Um, and so fast forward to fall of 2017, where I was contacted um, by Black Dog and Leventhal, my publisher, to put together a book of minis. So the first question that we had was, okay, how are we going to do this? Um, I'm not a maker myself. I don't necessarily own the images per se. So what you know, how's this going to work in terms of permissions? But there are tons of uh, these, you know, collaborative uh, photo books or book projects that exist today. So we just went for it. Um, and so the goal was to share 250 images of miniature work. And for me, I really, my goal was to show 250 different artists. Uh, so we're close to that in the book, roughly, we'll say 200 plus. But um, so I used existing images from the artists themselves. And then I collaborated with one of my friends, um, fellow motorcyclist, uh, John Sapinara and we um, we went into my collection and we took out 20, 30 some odd minis and we began to shoot them. So we, we went to his studio and we took just objects that were there and all of these are one takes which is really remarkable. It was just, I don't even, I don't even know how it happened but it was really magic um, where we have a, a goldfish bowl here and there's a fishing lure for scale. We've got an everything bagel, a salt shaker for scale. There's um, an Eames rocker with an Altoids case for scale. Um, both the goldfish bowl and the Eames rocker are here. And I would encourage you to pick up that Eames rocker. It is so light. It is paper light. Um, so we shot a number of works for the book using, as I mentioned, uh, objects that he had in his studio for scale. Does anyone want to take a guess what is used for coffee grounds. Whoa, <laughs> great grass, great guesses. It's they're coffee grounds. Someone had it. I think a couple of people had it. Um, so this is one of the first shots we took. I mentioned the one one takes. This was not a one take. We realized this was not intuitive intuitive um, enough necessarily to to know that those are coffee grounds. So we played around with some other objects. Got a coffee ground scooper that didn't feel quite right. We have a mug didn't feel quite right, uh, and then we landed on just some orange scissors. It kind of makes sense, kind of doesn't, but yeah, we had fun with it. Um, this was another shot where these miniature books um, were from the world's first all miniature bookstore in Tokyo, which has since closed. The entire when when the store closed, everything went up for auction, and I somehow didn't get outbid for this. These it was a lot of thirteen, um, and I have some of them here for you to take a peek at after this talk. But yeah, I talk about the one take. This wasn't quite a one take. We played a little bit around with the spines, um, and and yeah, the positioning of the books, and had a book, you know, subtly in the background there. So. Um, in some of the images that I received for this book, it was very difficult to determine what would get in, how to represent the most amount of artists from the most amount of countries, from the most amount of skill levels. Um, so we have strawberries from an artist in Italy. 
with a penny for scale. We got strawberries and apples uh, from an artist in the UK with a pencil for scale. And we've just got strawberries with a strawberry <laughs> for scale. And this artist um, is amazing. She's very young, out of Denmark, and I don't know how she does it. It drives me crazy. Okay, um, so in putting together the book, we, yeah, Miniac is a term I've heard, or Miniac, I'm a self-described Miniac, someone that loves minis. I've also heard it used for Mini Coopers, the car, but yeah, we played around with a couple um, book cover ideas. These are two of my favorite minis from my collection, but it didn't, something just didn't feel quite right. Um, so we also played around with this particular image. Um, and in, in the book, there are also micro miniatures, which are smaller than 112 scale. Um, but yeah, just something just didn't feel quite right. So they did, the publisher conducted a bit of user testing until we landed on this image. Um, and I have this breakfast plate here. But yeah, it seemed to appeal to the masses. Um, Maybe, is it savory? I don't know, the knife has some connotation, whatever it is, but that's where we landed for the, the cover of Book of Mini here. Okay, so just cruising right along. And uh, I just wanted to read a, a, just a quick quote. You know, we talk about the book covers, but I think this applies to miniatures, to art, to everything. Um, this is a quote by one of the makers in the book. Uh, Lauren Delaney George, who is the brains and the hands behind L. Delaney Miniatures. She's also, um, she's a, she does everything. She's a, an author herself. She lives in New Orleans and she has a ghost scavenger hunt where she hides miniatures and it's, it's unbelievable. So it's extraordinary that color and texture are a language that can be harnessed to communicate a cohesive story. Move the same elements around and you have a completely different tale. Okay, so wrapping up a bit here. Um, what's next? What's next for minis? There are miniature museums all around the world. There are miniature exhibitions that seem to pop up all over the place. Um, I have recently partnered with a miniature artist uh, who moved from New York to Boston this summer on the Miniature Museum, which Give us some time, but we're hoping to bring it to New York and have it be a small scale museum so that you're not gonna step foot into it, but it would be a, a miniature space that you can look into. That's, it's, it's unbelievable. I'm completely enamored with miniatures. I'm in awe of them and I continue to be. And um, you know, they mentioned it in, in that trailer. When something really speaks to you that way, go for it, whatever it is in this world. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a miniac. Are there any, are there any questions? Thank you guys for, for being here. Yeah.